Welcome to the Centre for Legal Innovations Legal Techie Tuesday series. We are very excited to have Tatiana Lenz and Samantha Loverish, co-founders from Legal Tech Helper, here with us today. Tatiana and Samantha will discuss and demonstrate a free and open source software web application, Divorce Helper. Again, welcome. Fabulous to have you all here. And now over to Tatiana and Samantha. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Loverich. I'm the co-founder of Legal Tech Helper with Tatiana Lenz. Uh, we're really delighted to be here to present to you and we thank the Centre for Legal Innovation for this opportunity. Uh, before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work and where we're presenting from today. We pay respects to ancestors and elders of the Kulin Nation past and present, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We acknowledge First Nations people around the world and affirm the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So a little bit about us. We're a Melbourne-based startup founded in 2019. We combine legal and technical experience and expertise I was a corporate lawyer and in corporate legal operations, and Tatiana is a software engineer. And our shared vision is to build accessible and inclusive technology that helps people be more empowered when they're dealing with the law. I mean, today's presentation will take you through how we see technology as an enabler so that can help bridge the access to justice gap. And we'll demonstrate to you our web application, Divorce Helper, as, and also illustrate how it was built using human-centered design principles, agile methodology, and free and open source software. And we'll also provide some tips and tools at the end of the session around how you can design and build your own legal products. So we operate in two markets. We build products for businesses to offer to consumers. So the business to business to consumer market and we also build products directly for consumers, the B2C, the business to consumer market. A divorce Helper is an example of a business to consumer product. So before going to the demonstration, we'll just do a little bit of a background around some different concerns of consumers and lawyers in the legal tech space. So firstly, um, concerns of users. Um, Consumers are um, basically bombarded with a lot of online legal information and often they don't really know where to start. Um, they feel like they're drowning in that, that information and it's very hard to navigate through, through that. Finding targeted online legal information for free and anonymously, which they can act upon in a way that's not overwhelming, can be a challenge. And understanding, you know, what's my next step and the pathway or the course of action they should take may not be very clear to them. For ordinary people wanting to understand, enforce and defend their rights, there can be a lot at stake. You know, this is my life that's being affected. And the emotions going through a legal process can't be underestimated. You know, it's often an experience that consumers didn't seek out or expect to go through. So those sorts of life experiences like family breakdown and divorce, infringements and fines, employment um, discrimination, dismissal, bankruptcy, these are huge kinds of events in people's lives. And with some online legal tools, lawyers may be imparting a lot of information up front and asking the consumer for personal information to establish eligibility or for client intake purposes. The consumer can be unsure as to where all this is heading. And on the flip side, the concerns of legal professionals. Legal technology has been traditionally aimed at improving the way lawyers work to, you know, from matter management and billing management to keeping track of and assigning work and improving operational efficiencies. But what about directly addressing the legal needs of legal consumers? 
I think it's fair to say that there's been some reluctance by lawyers to build online tools for consumers for fear of crossing that line from giving legal information to being seen to be giving legal advice and the regulatory issues that may flow from that. And there's also concerns around return on investment and basically the responsibility of keeping that information up to date and also whether those tools actually convert website visitors into paying clients. So when we're looking at automating, we'll go on to the next slide here in the quadrant around value and complexity. So what are the areas that may be worth automating or digitizing? What kind of legal problem is worth the time, money and effort to automate? Really the first step in the exercise is to identify repeatable work or queries that could be done more efficiently to free up time so that you can focus on high value and high complexity work. And really, as part of this exercise, the class of problems you probably want to focus on first are the golden triangle, of, <laughs> sorry, the golden quadrant in this, in this diagram. So this this bottom quadrant. It's the low value, low complexity work or where the client has low legal need, um, by which we mean they're not vulnerable or disadvantaged and where the volume of work or the frequency of work is high. So if we go to the next slide, the access to justice problem We've included here a quote, we'll go to this slide, from the recent Law Council of Australia paper in which they support self-help initiatives as a key solution to meeting legal demand from the missing middle. And, you know, really we question, you know, if careful considered advice is only available to the moneyed few, is this real access to justice? And are organisations that serve those with less financial means stretched to the point of not being able to provide services to those with no, most need? You know, it goes to the very heart of the legal system. If access to justice is only available to a few, how is it just? How can people have trust and confidence in the rule of law and the administration of justice? It's a philosophical question that we're all familiar with. So why use technology? Community legal centres and legal resources are stretched and eligibility is limited to those with greatest need. Our aim is to help the missing middle. So those people who don't qualify for legal aid but can't afford a lawyer and are missing out on legal help. Technology enables legal services to be scaled up from one to one, so the one lawyer to client relationship that we're very familiar with, to one to many. So where technology is being used to scale up and reach many more people and bring the costs down of delivering legal services. As we know through the pandemic, which has accelerated this, people are, are living their lives online and doing so much more digitally. So technology is obviously just absolutely key. And intermediaries, the role of intermediaries, those people who are the, the so-called non-legal professionals who are helping clients, social workers, um, admin staff, intake staff, those people who could be using technology tools to help clients with low literacy, or low legal capability or digital literacy or those who don't have access to technology. And we just see a really important role that intermediaries can play in this space. So for the Legal Tech Helper, our focus is on the consumer's experience of a legal system they often don't understand and which they often have to interact with at a time of turmoil. We aim to gradually build their knowledge, confidence and trust. So accessibility and inclusion is central to our design and build. Our starting point for Divorce Helper was that people have the right to understand the law and their legal rights, and they shouldn't have to trade their personal information to get legal information that's relevant to them. So we'll take you through some of the tools and methodology we use in terms of building we use human-centred design, 
We use agile methodology and free and open source software. There's a lot of written materials on all these topics, so we'll only touch briefly on these. Um, Human-centred design, absolutely critical to designing for consumers. Really the key concept of human-centred design or user-centred design or design thinking is really around empathy and stepping into the shoes of others, understanding their lives and starting to solve problems from their perspective. What this means for us is that we design our legal helpers to be used by real people in real contexts and directly involve users in design and testing. So you'll see from our demonstration that we have incorporated a lot of user testing into our design process um, and we'll be you know, really keen to show you what we've done there. Um, agile methodology, uh, many of you will be familiar with Agile. It's an iterative approach to project management and software development and basically allows for software to be designed, built, tested, iterated, you know, learnt from, from user testing and further iteration. So going faster and, and essentially learning as we go. A very flexible approach. I'm now going to hand over to Tatiana to talk about free and open source software and then to demonstrate Divorce Helper to you. So um, what we can see is that FOSS, uh, which is free and open source software, is licensed in a way that people can share the source code. Um, there are many different licenses, but the essential point is that people can incorporate software that others have built or released into their own projects. And of course, they can contribute back or even start their own software projects. FLOSS is just another acronym that's used. Um, there is sometimes confusion, the English word free connotes freedom, but it also means at no cost. So to avoid that confusion, to indicate that free software does not have to be given away at no cost, the word Libre is increasingly used. So FLOSS stands for free slash Libre open source software. And um, I'm just going to out, there are so many advantages to this, but I'm just going to outline a few. Um, the big one is that there's a very large community of developers um, and there are sort of ecosystems of community support. Um, and also the applications are more secure. There are more eyes on the source code, more people reporting bugs and vulnerabilities, um, fixing and testing those fixes. And um, now this might seem paradoxical to some people, but there's actually um, a longer, uh, there's longevity um, to uh, FLOSS. Um, if you don't have proprietary, um, vendors um, that may, for example, go out of business or have decided um, to completely rebuild their platform, you have no choice but to migrate. But many FLOSS projects um, have been going for decades. And actually, the web itself is in some ways an example of this collaborative um, work and um, is powered by open source software. So uh, we are using um, DocAssemble. It's open source software under an MIT license. It's written in Python. It has a very active international community, although it is mainly based in the USA. It has really, really great documentation. And um, it's written for lawyers by lawyers. Um, and I've added here, although they're very geeky, lawyers. Um, so I just want to just point out a few projects to you. Um, we can't really talk too much about them, but maybe you can investigate them on your own. Um, so there's Upsolve, and um, it's actually recently been in the news um, in the New York Times. Um, it's um, a guided pathway 
to help people declare uh, bankruptcy in the US. Uh, there's mass access um, built by the Suffolk Law School, Legal um, Innovation and Technology Lab. Um, so that's actually a really big project. Um, there's uh, MADE, uh, which is a self-guided um, eviction help um, by the Greater Boston Legal Services, which is kind of like legal aid there. And um, it was recently uh, mentioned by the Biden administration in a White House briefing as a great example of um, access to justice um, project. And um, just uh, another project up to code again in Massachusetts, um, whereby um, tenants can check if their rented premises are in breach of the state sanitary code. Um, and now I just want to um, turn our attention to Divorce Helper. So um, Divorce Helper is a web application that we built using design principles and um, agile methodology and open source software, as we said. Um, and it guides people through the divorce process in an empathetic way. Um, it's free for users to use and they can remain anonymous. And it's particularly helpful for people who are thinking of separating or have recently separated. Um, when they don't understand the legal lay of the land yet and um, the legal processes around um, family law. So um, I just want to say that in building the, our um, web application, we iterated through um, the design several times and we got perspectives from our um, users. Um, we also, in the course of that, got some negative feedback and that's almost inevitable um, but that's actually quite helpful in um, identifying sorry <laughs> in identifying areas that we could um, improve so um, here's the QR code for the release that's available publicly but I'm just going to step through it let's start the demo if you go to legaltechhelper.com.au, uh, if you go to the news section and scroll down a little bit, we have the link here to Divorce Helper. Um, so as you can see, it's a clean, uh, minimal user interface. Right away, we tell the users that we will give you legal um, information about divorce in Australia. And um, because it's a web application and it's available on the web, it's really important to identify the jurisdiction. Uh, we, re we let the users know that um, this is not legal advice. Um, we also let them know that this tool is free to use and they don't need to identify themselves. So it's anonymous. It was very important for us um, with Divorce Helper for users to be able to get targeted legal information without having to give away identifying information about themselves. Um, if the users want some more information, they can click on this uh, more information button. Now, when I say click, of course, on the mobile phone, uh, you're using gestures, so you would be touching that button. And he, here you can see the difference between legal information and legal advice, um, explained a little bit for the users. This difference, um, of course, is very clear to legal professionals but it's not clear to your average consumer. So it's really important that we provide that information to the user. And um, I just want to note that um, this is um, a certain design pattern that we've used over and over again in this application. Um, the user receives some information and, and um, or maybe they get asked a question 
And then if they want some more information, if they choose to click this button, they'll receive uh, more information. And this helps um, to not flood or overwhelm the user with too much information. And it also accommodates different styles of navigation. Some users want to race um, through the uh, web application to get an understanding of the whole process. Um, others want to take their time and take in the details. They don't want to miss anything. Also another design pattern is that we've tried to keep the navigation really simple. So we have these two buttons, continue and more information. And um, of course we have the top navigation bar, but we'll look at that a little bit later. So this all helps uh, with reducing the cognitive load on the user. So for the moment, let's just um, click on the continue button. As we come to this page, um, we say before you start, you should uh, be in a safe environment. And this is alluding to a couple of things. Um, of course, family violence, um, first and foremost, but it's also um, a kind of prompt for the user to consider their physical environment. Um, for instance, they might have children who might be um, in or around their immediate space and they may want to consider how using Divorce Helper might affect them. Uh, we also give a rough estimate uh, of how long it might uh, take to go through this guided procedure, so 15 to 20 minutes. Um, again, people are very used to transacting all sorts of um, all sorts of aspects uh, of their lives online and um, on their mobile phones, but it's just good for them to know at the outset that they need some dedicated time. And we also give permission um, for the users. Um, we tell them if it feels like too much, it's okay to leave and come back when you're ready. Um, and lastly, on the page, we're um, asking them, are you feeling safe now? I'm just going to answer no for now, just to give you an idea of how we immediately respond to that information. So we give the users uh, some um, quick information that they can action immediately if they are in fact um, in an unsafe or even violent situation. Now, um, just to give you an idea of how it looks on a mobile device, I'm just going to be using um, Chrome Web Developer Tools. And I'm just going to be um, looking at a layout on a mobile phone. I'll just um, undock this. Um, so you can have a better view. So on a mobile phone, they can of course um, use these links to make actual phone calls. So here, here, here. Um, and as you can see, they've got um, an exit button here and also the same quick exit button um, in the top navigation. So the button is always in the right uh, top corner. And um, it's also pretty bright orange um, so that it doesn't get lost on the page. And I just want to say that um, it's pretty much um, a standard design pattern now for um, sides dealing with family law um, and especially those dealing with family violence to have a quick exit button. Now, I'm just going to continue, but I just want to also just say that um, 
a responsive layout um, is pretty standard these days. So it means that the web application or any web page for that matter should render well on um, a mobile device uh, like a tablet or mobile phone. And um, here's an interesting statistic that I looked up recently. Um, smartphone usage has reached over 80% of the world's population. So that's 80% of humanity on this entire planet are using uh, smartphones. So um, this is really important. But um, let's um, continue along here. Now on this page, we get a notice that this application, um, the version that is public, publicly available, um, was built before the merger of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court. Um, there is a newer version, but it's not publicly available yet. So um, as a user, we're just going to acknowledge this message telling us effectively that um, directions and legal procedures have changed in the meantime. We'll just continue along. And um, now I really want to talk about this screen. Um, through our user testing, we actually found that users were saying that we jumped in too quickly into explaining um, the legal aspects of divorce. And one of the things that we needed to change was to acknowledge where people were at. So that's part of the empathetic component. We needed to acknowledge the range of emotions people might be experiencing. Um, we added the screen and conceptually it's quite simple. There's a dark cloud and raindrops that are maybe reminiscent of tears. That's sort of the suggestion here. And there's also a suggestion that maybe a, the storm will pass or maybe that there's a silver lining somewhere down the road. Um, users said to us um, in subsequent user testing rounds that they really appreciated having their emotions validated. And um, often when they were going through this list, um, you know, here, anger, sadness, regret or relief, because some people are relieved, um, they would identify that that was something that they had in fact experienced. Um, now, here we go on to acknowledge that um, the whole process can be stressful or confusing or take up a lot of their time. So we had people kind of emoting during user testing. Yes, it does take up a lot of my time as they were going through the application. So as I said, it's an important empathetic screen but it's also important in terms of building trust. Um, the user is more likely to trust that they will receive um, information that is of value to them. And it also positions the web application as a tool that can be trusted. And this can manifest in a couple of ways. Users can be more likely to answer questions and um, they may not give up halfway through and they may be more likely to heed the targeted information that they've been given and action it. Um, so as I said, this is actually quite an important screen and in some ways we were actually quite surprised just how important it was to the users. Okay, so going on now, we're now starting to um, give some information about what divorce means. Um, and so we've literally framed this information. Um, we've put an eye here and a sort of distinctive green color to impress on the user that this is a little nugget of information. Um, and as they go through the application, we 
like to what we term kind of sprinkle information throughout the course um, of the application um, interspersed of course with um, you know um, questions that they may be answering and um, of course as they're answering the questions um, they're getting uh, information that's more and more targeted to their situation and their particular circumstances um, and here again we see this design pattern of giving the users some information but um, things like the legislation the family law act and um, you know which court deals um, with family law matters is tucked away in this more information section so you know we don't even use words like um, federal legislation for instance we um, just say that um, it's Australian family law and that it applies throughout the whole of Australia um, we've had to find ways to explain some of this in a very simple way so for instance when we come um, later on to giving information about family violence orders for example we have to um, explain to people that they have to apply to a different court that um, it is the magistrate's courts in your state that will handle those orders um, again it's a matter of explaining the legal system to the users that for legal professionals is completely obvious um, and we can also see that we're starting to introduce um, some terms that are important for people to understand in this uh, family law space so um, we have these what's kind of known as popover widgets so here's one for instance um, explaining parenting here's one um, explaining financial matters and um, FDR so um, it, it's the first introduction and um, as they go on with the application they get sort of more detailed explanations but um, it's a good way of um, introducing these to people and um, we kind of use that same those same definitions here for instance in the uh, more information section and um, here we can see that uh, we're still making reference to the Federal Circuit Court so at this stage it might be um, better to switch over to the current version of the application that is not um, available publicly yet um, but before I do I actually want to just um, show you quickly how um, this top navigation works in some ways uh, it's even simpler on a mobile phone so this arrow will take you back a screen and um, if we um, use this drop down we can restart the whole uh, of Divorce Helper the whole guided procedure and um, we can get some very basic information about uh, the web application and again using that design pattern of you know we um, we give a little bit of an, of information and then if people want to know more they can uh, read more and the same thing with our privacy policy and um, terms of use we can just dismiss those or we can um, read more about them finally let's use the uh, quick exit button as you can see um, I'll just get out of full screen mode as you can see we've ended up um, on a new tab um, at the media uh, Bureau of Meteorology website and where we were um, this page has essentially uh, taken us to Google so I'm just gonna 
dismiss this and um, now start the um, new application. So I'm going to um, continue the demo with a new version of our web application, uh, the one that's been updated but isn't available publicly yet. And um, as you can see, I'm just uh, now on my local server on localhost. And um, yeah, I'll be um, demonstrating from here from now on. So I'm going to go through this application fairly quickly. Uh, we don't have much time left. So as you can see, the initial part is pretty similar to what you've already seen. We have introduced some new screens. Um, and here, for example, we explain the emphasis that uh, the newly formed Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia is placing on safety. So we have some additional information here about what safety actually means. Let's just see it on a mobile phone. Um, it is a very long screen. So we've added a little bit of a visual indicator for people to scroll down. And as you can see, we've tried to include authoritative definitions of family violence. And we have external links to sites like Relationships Australia. So we can refer users to the great resources and work done by other organisations. We don't have to do all the heavy lifting ourselves. Uh, let's just go back um, to the desktop view again. Um, the user here is um, again visually primed to understand that this is an important bit of information and we are introducing more terms to them, uh, like arrangements for the children. Here we have something that's quite interesting. So up until now, we've usually had our screens with just two buttons, with yes and no buttons, or um, continue and more information. And initially for this screen, uh, we did just have a yes and no button, uh, button, sorry, but our users told us um, that they felt confused. Even though we do provide definitions of parenting orders and consent orders, they were still hesitating about which option to choose and it was too much to ask them to make a meaningful choice um, because they were so unsure and those choices would take them down a different pathway. Um, so we added the not sure button. We also found that some users wanted a more detailed explanation of parenting at this stage. Now we do provide more detailed information later on in the guided pathway, but they wanted to, in a sense, skip ahead to that. So we had to incorporate different ways of going through the guided procedure. We essentially enabled them to kind of fast forward to that information, to that more detailed information, but still ask them all the questions that we needed to in order to target them with relevant information so that they didn't miss out on receiving any information by taking this route. And this lends itself particularly well to the way DocAssemble is structured. One of the core concepts of DocAssemble is that what I would call a just-in-time posing of questions. For now, um, let's choose the Not Sure button. So we have some information about child support and another screen about child support. Now, note that there's a specific amount there for the income and um, these amounts are stored in variables so when they increase we can just change those figures and they'll be propagated throughout the entire application so we don't have to 
um, change the source code for the interviews. A little bit more about financial matters, um, sort of a similar array of buttons um, for financial agreements or financial orders. And now um, we're being asked, um, did you get married on or before the 14th of February 2020? So that's doing um, a calculation there, um, going back two years. Now I'm doing this um, a little bit before the actual presentation. So um, the date there is sort of reflective of that. Sometimes users want to know why we're asking them for this information. So there's just a little bit about that. So let's say yes. And um, here we have quite an important screen. Again, our users told us uh, in user testing that they wanted to know why they were uh, we were asking about family violence. So here we're explaining um, to them why it's important for them to disclose family violence and that their pathway through the family law system is quite different if they have um, experienced family violence. And then we go on to actually ask the question, um, have you and your children experienced abuse or violence from your spouse? So Notice we're including children there because um, they've already told us that uh, they have children. And again, we immediately respond to that. Now, there aren't many places in this application where we give the same information over again, but um, with the hotlines, we just decided that it was, it was good to give them again. And um, we have some further list of support services and um, we tell them about FAST, Family Advocacy and Support Services. Now, notice that there's some COVID specific information here. Um, so that's also driven by a variable. It's essentially a flag. And, um, you know, hopefully one day when the COVID pandemic is over, we'll be able to reset that flag. And here we're being asked about which state or territory we are actually in. So I'm going to choose Victoria. So then I actually get a list of this targeted information of services that are uh, available in Victoria. Some more. So we're talking about family violence intervention orders, um, which are specific to Victoria and... Um, and if I go into more information here, um, we have various links. So, for instance, um, a link to the um, Victorian uh, Magistrates Court that um, gives us some more information about the orders. We've got the VLA, the Victorian Legal Aid Service, and we've also got um, things like... Um, the Victorian Police, um, the Family Violence Protection Act, which is a state act. Okay. So now we come to, I'll just close some of these other um, tabs. Uh, now we come to the main screen where users can um, drill down to um, topics that um, they're interested in at this particular stage of their separation and divorce uh, process. Now, obviously, as family law practitioners will know, uh, that's the big topic there. There's quite a lot in there. Uh, but for this demo, I'm just going to go through the divorce um, application process very quickly. So we'll just start um, to see if you can apply for divorce. So I'm, I'm just going to um, just step through these. So are you an Australian citizen? Yes. Has your marriage broken down? I'm not sure what that is. Read a bit about it. Decide yes, my marriage has broken down. Um, have we been separated uh, on or before that date? That's actually a year and a day ago. 
So yes, we've been separated for that long. And then I get a message um, that I can apply for divorce in Australia and there's a bit of recapitulation. You have told us this, you, that you're an Australian citizen. Marriage has broken down. You've been separated for 12 months and a day and so you qualify under the Australian law. Um, then we're just asking sole or joint application so we have some more information here um, particularly around if you're applying together who has to be eligible uh, for a fee reduction say so i was born in australia do i have a copy of my marriage certificate yes um is your marriage certificate in english just for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to say no. And have you and your spouse been living in the same home uh, for any part of the 12 months? No. And here I get a summary of the documents um, that I will need um, to file the application for divorce. So there's the uh, application for divorce itself, the marriage certificate. Um, now, because I've said that the marriage certificate is not in English, um, I will need to provide a translation um, with the marriage certificate and the translator will also need to complete an affidavit, translation of marriage certificate, then there's the prescribed brochure, a fee, and now we can actually um, have a more detailed list that, as it says, you can download or email to yourself and keep for reference. So this is particularly great when there are um, non-legal uh, intermediaries who are assisting um, their uh, clients. So... We've got the checklist and we've also got uh, more information um, about the documents that are needed uh, with links on uh, more with more information or where to download them from. So for instance, uh, because this is a sole application, uh, I will need to serve my spouse and I'll need to download the prescribed um, brochure so um, that I know where um, I can get it and here is the um, divorce service kit so that I can um, so I can download it and um, serve my spouse I think I'm going to have to end there obviously yeah it's a very rich application and there's a lot more to it but um, that concludes our demo for today. So when we built Divorce Helper um, we considered um, accessibility and inclusion, reduction of complexity um, and reduction of the cognitive load on the user, readability and empathy and trauma-informed response. Now we're kind of running out of time, so I was going to talk uh, at a bit more length, but I'll, I'll just skip ahead um, so that we have time for questions. Um, I'll I will just mention, um, we've um, released on GitHub um, the automated readability indexing, uh, which helps to reduce the complexity of the language. So if you want to check that out on GitHub, um, that would be great. Uh, but um, just uh, to conclude my um, presentation, I just wanted to share what one user told us uh, after using Divorce Helper, not as complicated as I thought, felt simple and fast. And just to wrap up, so some lessons for design and build. If you're designing and building workflow or documentation, docu document automation, and you haven't um, done so before, 
uh, we'd just like to remind you of the importance of the following things. Um, one is to engage users early and often to gain a deep understanding of their needs, frustrations and expectations. To engage the right subject matter experts to identify gaps from a legal and process perspective to commit time to design workflow that removes or reduces friction for users. And that does take time. Um, so do have that time available and commit to ongoing testing and iterating and time to expand, improve and refine content and workflow. So just to um, wrap up, these are our contact details. If you'd like to contact us, please do so. We would love to collaborate with you, always looking for interesting projects. Um, and yes, if you've got any questions, please let us know. Thank you, Samantha and Tatiana, for a very informative session. That was really, really interesting. If anyone has any questions about Divorce Helper, please pop them in the Q&A bubbles below and Samantha and Tatiana can address them while they're here with us. It was really interesting to hear about the benefits of using free and open source software and how Divorce Helper allows consumers to gain a rapid understanding of the legal process around separation and divorce. So it doesn't look like there's any questions at this stage, um, so we might draw to a close. If anybody has any questions after the session, you can contact Samantha and Tatiana on the details on the screen so on their website um, via email to samantha on twitter or via linkedin um, a huge thank you to all of you who have attended today as you know the center for legal innovation is very much focused on these types of webinars this type of information sharing collaboration and experience exchange we are all about practical solutions there will be many more webinars coming up in the Legal Ticket Tuesday series, so don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter or Facebook for announcements. We look forward to welcoming you back to one of our events and thank you again very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Samantha and Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>